Welcome, guys, to this week's episode of The Tops. My name is Craig Prowse, and joining me is Mandrew Montz. Mandrew Mole. Mandrew Mole. And this, guys, is a show where we bring you a list of tops. Now, this particular episode is based on the top Super Nintendo games, but the hitch, the pitch, the glitch is that it does not include a game that's um, Mario derived. It's not Mario centric because. I got to pick this one, and my main thing was, if you look up any YouTube video of the top any Nintendo game or system... It's all Mario. It, yeah, Mario kind of peppers that list exclusively, and I kind of want to showcase maybe a couple more games that you guys may have not have heard of, and when I pitched it to Andrew, he was fine with it. Oh, I'm all about it. So, Andrew, we have our list. Would you like to go first or second? I'll go first. All right. We'll start us off, baby boy. The first game that I will start off with of... My top five for the SNES would be Mortal Kombat 2. Ooh, okay. One, it's, uh, the characters are there. This is when they kind of really started branching out with, okay, we're going to take this ball, we're just going to run with it now. You're getting all kinds of new characters, such as Katana and Melina, which are just like Sub-Zero Scorpion. They also introduced Reptile. You're getting people like Kung Reptile Lao. Reptile came in MK2? Yes. Oh, awesome. Perfect. And okay. so they, they just fully embraced a palette swap. They embraced what they were. We're not going to try to copy anyone else. We're just going to take our, our fatalities, our characters, our crazy roster people, and even some of our palette swap people, and just really get it out there. They even introduced some of the other later uh, in the hidden one is where you fight new Cybot in this oh. game too. So which is just another, you know, palette swap or even the Air Mac code, which you can see in, uh, you know, the, which was the big rumor, which spawned another character later on, which is just another palette swap, which was kind of just, they wholly embraced what they were. An amazing fighting game, crazy roster of people that just all kinds of abilities and they wholeheartedly embraced all the fatalities. It just made an amazing game. And the sequel I is, by all means, a way better game than the original. The original is a good game. A but Mortal successor. Kombat 2 is one of those games that just eclipses, I think, the original in every way. Actually, you know what? Nothing you're saying. I might have Mortal Kombat 2 back here. Um, that I also... Love, I would love to play that later. Brought in Shao Kahn, the brick Ooh. shithouse that we know and love today. Shao Kahn. Ooh, big dog status. Excellent. Excellent choice. I didn't know that that was the first appearance of Reptile in my head, in my mind. Reptile's... Game one, I thought. No, he's a, yeah, it's he's introduced in two. Oh, perfect, awesome, excellent. And again, guys, we don't. I his list is right there, but I haven't looked at it. He hasn't looked at mine, so we are going on the fly here on who's coming up with what. So excellent choice. Mine, guys, goes into uh, Lost Vikings. And Andrew, I don't know if you've ever played it. Never even heard Lost of Lost Vikings was a game that was developed by uh, Silicon and Synapse, and it was published by Interplay Studios, and it was released on April 29th. 1995. You can also find it later in 2003 on GBA. Uh, interestingly enough, released by Blizzard. Now, this game was a, a platformer, but very interesting because what it was is you play between three different characters. It was Eric the Swift, Olaf the Stout, and Balog the Fierce. Now, the three characters had all had different abilities. Eric could uh, run, he could jump, and he could crush into walls. Olaf had his shield where he could essentially create another platform for your character to jump on. He could block incoming um, projectiles. And he had a he kind of had this gliding, hovering move where he could jump down and, and you know collect things. And then you had Balog who could actually he was your range, he had an arrow and he had a sword. Um, the concept of the game, it, it's it's a two player it's a two-player game, or you could do it one player, and you could um, hit, like, I think it was the L or R back yeah. on the Nintendo, and you could just switch between the guys. Now, the cool the concept was to get them to the end of the level, because the premise of the story was that they got kidnapped by a uh, character named Tomator, and he wanted to collect them for a galactic zoo, so they eventually escaped, and now the premise is you find yourself in different areas of time that now the guys have to escape. The awesome part of Sounds this thing. Sounds pretty cool. Oh, man. It's not only is it visually good to look at, which I, I almost I want to say, say about any Super games, Nintendo yeah. games hold up, which is odd. I mean, for, for an old system like that, is um, it's it's an awesome uh, puzzle platformer, right? So it's not just a platformer jumping from A to B. There's, there's strategy involved. You have to go collect something with two Vikings to come back and get something with the third. And there's a lot of just uh, interesting dynamics that you can explore and... The cool thing was, is it's 37 levels that you have to do this game. So it's not just a one and done in a couple hours. It's 
it's something you have to literally kind of play with, experiment with, because if one of the Vikings die, they all have a hit point. If one of them dies, you can't complete the level, but the game continues, which gives you a chance to kind of explore the level, right? So you can kind of look around and see what you want to do next. Right. Um, the cool thing was there also was a Lost Vikings 2 that was released that you can like uh, if you wanted to go play it. It had two new characters involved in it, and it also had um, every character got an additional ability. But I wanted to throw this out because uh, Blizzard did develop it on the GBA. If you These guys actually did have some cameos in some other games. You can find them in uh, Clay Fighter, and I think Clay Fighter 2. But in World of Warcraft, they had a thing where... Uh, I forget the name of the mission, but there was two items you had to go on a quest for, and spelt backwards was Lost and Vikings that did oh, something. that's pretty cool. And then there was an NPC, and I, I believe it was Olaf, that you could find during a certain time, and he would kind of take you on this quest. So I really liked that Blizzard kind of grabbed that ball and ran with it. But guys, check out Lost Vikings. Um, a very fun game, and I think you'll enjoy it. Nice, nice. Uh, my next one, and I don't think it's got as rich a history, but like many Super Nintendo games or the many on my list, one of the biggest reasons I love it is for the phenomenal soundtrack is oh. Zombies Ate My Neighbors, oh, dude. which I did not know came out on a Sega system like what you were saying until we had that conversation. Yeah, because I've only I, ever played it on Super yeah, Nintendo. Yeah, he was asking me about it, and this was like a couple days ago, so I wasn't sure if he was... I didn't know this was going to be on his list, but yeah, because I remember playing it on the Sega Genesis, and I don't, I don't think there's too big of a difference between the Sega and the Super. I think they're a pretty uh, traditional port, but the music is fantastic, and the, when Andrew calls me... His ringtone is uh, Zombies Ate My Neighbors from, I, I think it's the third or fourth level, the mall, the killer oh, mall yeah. or whatever. So, so love that game. Love yeah, it. love Zach, it. I, I remember the kid's name because I always played him, Zach, or Zeke. I don't remember the girl's name because I don't oh, play I, I can't even remember. I forgot to look it up. But um, I, definitely an amazing game, an amazing game that you can play in two-player. And it plays out, and oddly enough, it's... You would describe it as a top down, but it's almost not like a top down. You don't see the top of their heads. Yeah, you can see yeah, them almost I from the what front. You're saying. Yeah, so it kind of hits you from that angle, and it's that I don't know what you would call 99 that. Ninety-nine levels of terror, right? Is that the <laughs> yeah is that the thing? But either way, you're pretty much roaming around and you're trying to save other citizens. There's zombies, all kinds of monsters, all the hell's pretty much broken loose, and you can find all kinds of different little things that will help you out. So you there's like a squirt gun, soda cans. Uh, just even like tomatoes or you can drink this formula that turns you into like this yeah. big hulking monster and so you're trying to save these people before you can exit the level and go to the next one essentially is what it is so you're just this boy and this girl it's a good amazing two-player game Great it's two very player, yeah. fun to play with somebody else especially once i forget what the level is i think it's the fourth one and it's like um i think it's hedge maze panic is what it's called right. and it mixes up the dynamic between the levels because some levels have bosses. In this level that I'm describing, it's you're in a big hedge maze and there's all these Jason-like people there wearing hockey masks, cutting through the hedge with a chainsaw. So that changes up the di- the dynamic uh, of the how map, you would yeah. go through the map. Let alone they're also killing the survivors and like lowering your, the score that you can get as you're trying to exit. And they're actually beating it. And I've tried a bunch oh, of times. Yeah. I, I always end up dying or getting my ass kicked and. Sure, one of these days I'll really like sit down and want to try it out. We we'd have to play it on like a modded one to where we could get so far and save it, and then if we continue on die because yeah that it's just too gruesome to do without a without like a game. Genie. It's a tough one, but it's amazing. And as I said before, that soundtrack is absolute fire. Yeah, every level is fantastic. So yeah, excellent choice. Um, my next one and number four is the nice two player, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Turtles in Time. It was Turtles Four. Uh, by Konami came out on August 15, 1992. It's an actual sequel. It's an actual sequel to the original game that came out right before uh, the Ninja Turtles arcade game. It's regarded as one of the best port arcade games. I love that, it. It looks great. That were done in the time, yeah. It, it, it holds up graphically. It holds up um, audioly. Audioly? Uh, with all the sound intact. Um, the cool thing that I liked about it the most was that it, it kind of cross-referenced the animated show with the movies because you would see like Reza and Taka and Super Shredder, which are movie based. Yeah. But then you would see like Baxter Stockman, Bebop and Rocksteady. And essentially the premise is you obviously, I, I think the Statue of Liberty gets stolen by Krang. You've got to go fight him. You go fight Shredder pretty quick. And then he sends you through time. And now through the rest of the game, you're hitting these levels with bosses that you would normally recognize as like Bebop and Rocksteady in, in their normal wear you're fighting them as like pirates on a pirate ship right. or something like that. And it, 
it's just a very, very great uh, pickup that's a two-player um, beat-em-up. But they also did a remake in 2009 called Turtles in Time Reshelled. And it kind of had that new graphic uh, code on it, like what we're talking with uh, Streets of Rage. Yeah, that gloss. So it's definitely out there you can pick it up, but highly recommend it. It's a perfect two-player pickup. Uh, slash and bash them, so. Yeah, especially, I mean, that's always a really fun one to play. Yeah, I think you can be, obviously beat it. I think you can beat it in, like, just an hour or two if you're cruising, so. <laughs> For a bruising? <laughs> uh, my next one is going to be Mega Man X. Oh. So, out of all the Mega Man, all, out of all the other ones that I had ever played, you know, this one is when they kind of reestablished who Mega Man was. He's a little bit, the, the universe is a little bit darker. He's a little bit edgier. It's not the same happy, lighthearted Mega Man as seen in the other ones that kind of looks a little bit kitty. This is when they did, like, complete redesign, redesign of the enemies, and you have people like Chill Penguin, Sigma. This is when they started introducing Zero, and he makes nice. his appearance. And it's, uh, again, an um, amazing soundtrack. I listen to it all the time. I have, like, a big playlist of, like, video game, you know, music. And this is always one that just always gets me. But just, I think the story is absolutely great. It's the same, plays out the same as the other Mega Man. You're scrolling, you know, left, right on the screen, trying to make it to the boss, kill the boss, get their ability. And then I think this one, I don't know if the other ones played into it as much because I didn't play them as much, but that was always my favorite thing is figuring out which boss hurts which one the most. So using all these different abilities. And actually, I didn't really beat this game until maybe like four years ago when I actually sat down went through, I'm not a kid anymore, because it's a game I go through and play yearly, and then I kind of just, like, drop it halfway through, and then I just finally sat down one day, and I'm like, all right, dude, I'm going to play this all the way through, and nice. it's it's always been a great time. It's it's That's the fun of it. This is something that you can pick up, go through, get as far as you can, and I don't feel, like, defeated or, like, damn, I wasted my time. I'm not even beating this. <laughs> Plus, it's still a little bit archaic as you're using the little codes for the cheat system or the save system. There's no actual save system. So yeah, throws that reminiscent back to the old school system. Yeah. So I, you know, you have your notebook, I don't like pages down or even now and then when I just want to try to jump to the end, I'll, you know, put in the code, redo whatever. And then just still, cause even still that last boss is just one hell of a fight. How far did the X series go? I think it goes, like, all the way up to, like, nine. Okay, because I remember when I was in uh, college in my dorm room, me and uh, my I had two roommates. It was Cameron and Steve, and we each had Super Nintendo setups, and there, I'm telling you, it was, like, two, three, four days of us just setting it up, and all anyone was doing was we were, try, we were beating Mega Man 1 up until, I, I, I can't remember what the last X was, but... I mean, collectively as a group, I, I think it goes to we X9. did it, but uh, yeah, that I just remember X was the one everyone was looking forward to because if we were past the Nintendo, we we're finally yeah. Because this story is collectively different because it's there's Mega Man and it's all in the same universe, and then this one is like years, years, years oh, afterwards. Okay. Awesome. And so he's based on the original Mega Man, which oh. I they call him. I don't I. Because this one they call X all the time. The other one they actually call Mega Man, or I think they refer to him as, like, the hero. And so this one is about, um... They call them Reploids is what they are, is, like, the robots. And then when they turn bad, and it's due to, like, a virus that's corrupting them. And so that's how you get people like Chill Penguin or, you know, Flame Mammoth. Excellent. I like that. And so it's that pretty cool. anime at all? I, I do of, remember the, the episode it, where the, there, is, there is an episode in the anime where this one ties into it and then they even remade it for the PSP oh, and they added different options and like and more story to it where there's like anime cutscenes and you can even play as vile the dude who catches you at the very beginning and you get more into the story is X like all these people were good Sigma was like a legendary good guy just like X and you're hunting down pretty much your old teammates and so that's something too that kind that's of talk shit cool. to you about yeah. like you're a team killer like you're killing your comrades I like that I like and so that. It, it added like a whole lot more which was Kind of crazy to think, like, for the PSP, you know? Yeah, that's... I, I love a good twist in the storyline, so... And it's... I, I liked it back as far as the SNES. That's when we were having it done. Uh, my next, guys, moves into our three spot, and that is Harvest Moon. Now, if you guys aren't familiar with Harvest Moon, um, it is a game developed by Amkiss, published by, in uh, North America by Natsu, and it was released in North America in 1997. Now, this was my first experience with a lot of different concepts so not only was it my first like life simulator type game i didn't even know it was a SNES game i thought the first one was on like gamecube no a lot of people think it's like gba or gamecube because they're they're the first one that's part of the um it's the uh god what was it called 
uh, the seasons of or the oh, what was it? Let me see if I can find it. Yeah. I know it's got like a weird name. I know what you're talking about, where it follows like a certain like line. Oh, story of seasons. That's okay. So yeah. we change it in the West to be Harvest Moon. It's now known as the story of season. It's the first one to kick it off. So. Essentially what you are is you're a kid that inherits land from your parents and you have to clean up this whole farm. Um, and again, what it introduced me to first was it it brought me into a day and night cycle. Right? I wasn't familiar with that in a game because you literally have to manage your time by you know, picking your crops, watering your crops during the day, and then doing things at night which you can't do you know, during different times. You also can get into a marriage. You can also go to festivals. You can upgrade your equipment. It's it's like a pseudo RPG where you have to do things like that. Um, the concept is essentially just to get the best ending you can. And if I'm not if I'm remembering correctly, it's it's either three or four seasons that you get to go to. So, but the seasons are b- broken down into months. So fall is thirty days, winter is thirty days. Right. And then it's just it's so in debt because like when you get a cow you have to pay attention to it you have to make sure you're feeding it you have to make sure you're um petting it because the cows can get sick and if they get sick you now have to go take it to get medicine and now does that take up your whole day instead of watering your crops because if you miss watering your crops they're not going to grow if you don't feed your chicken they're not going to lay eggs i never played any of those so i didn't know they were like that crazy about it it's and and it's the most simplest uh, version of it because if you get any of the other ones that are on like the PlayStation or the GameCube or GBA, they're a lot more in depth. But the Super Nintendo one was one that me and my brother played a ton of. It's a game I remember my mom getting me and coming home and it sitting on our bed and because she, she knew we wanted it. Um, it's got fantastic graphics like any other SNES game does. Um, it is the first weather matters, right? If you if your guy stays out too late in the rain, you'll get sick, and then you'll have to stay in bed all day, and that that can wipe you out. So See, I didn't even know it affected the person. I thought it was just the things around you. Yeah, it, it was the first time too that I was experienced with multiple endings that weren't based on like who you beat as a boss, like because the ending is based on how well you did your farm. Who you married? Did you upgrade your house? Did you upgrade all your weapons? So I didn't even did, know it had an ending. I thought have, it was like Animal Crossing, yeah, where it's just did infinite. you have kids? So it gave me a lot at a very young age that let me appreciate other things like that more. So Harvest Moon on SNES hits that spot. That's a pretty good one then. Uh, yeah, I didn't know anything about that game. You do. I, you do. I thought it was just like a like I said a, like an Animal Crossing. Oh well, here's the, here's one side thing. So it, it there's 28 titles that run in Story of Seasons slash Harvest Moon. So the genre is definitely there. People are playing it. And then since then, there's been 14 spinoffs yeah, of that a, game. It's always so, been a pretty big game yeah, as far as I know. It's Just, got I its audience. It. Uh, and speaking of big games, next one would be Legend of Zelda Link to the Past. There it is. Pink haired Link. I knew it was coming. I knew of it was course. coming. It's got to make everybody's list or be on somebody's list because it's a lot of people... Yeah. Are, if you don't have Mario on the list, it, Link's making it. Yeah, it could always be a lot of people's first Zelda. I know a lot of people skipped it on the Nintendo, and that that's just their intro is A Link to the Past. Yeah, that it was, is my, my, it was my first intro. Yeah, it's my first intro, too. I had to go back and play the old school ones. Yeah, just classic top-down, kind of roaming this huge, gigantic world. And then, of course, they introduced the dark world where everything's different. People aren't friendly anymore. They're evil like instead. Yeah, or, upside down. <laughs> and and I, I loved, that was one of my favorite aspects of it is because it just seemed like it's, you know, it's double the size. It's double the map. There's so much you get to do because you have this flip side of what you, uh, you know, it, a dungeon you might be completing is just completely different on the other yeah, side. Yeah, on its head. And uh, again, favorite thing, Soundtrack, always. Soundtrack oh. is just absolutely amazing. Yeah, I remember the first time you start playing that game, that soundtrack pops. I mean, there's no, I don't think there's one dull moment. Besides, I mean, obviously the game starts with the rain. Yeah, you know, oh, that, yeah. And that was the first time you heard a game Super do iconic, so. yeah, from what I can remember. And then even looking back at it now, I was watching a video the other day about, like, the Zelda timelines. And just, even though they've gone back and retconned it, it makes it seem more intricate. Like... In this Zelda timeline, I think this is the one where the hero loses instead of wins, and relations broke down between the humans and the Zoras. So, like, in this game, like, Zoras are monsters, and as I grew up, like, in the 64 games or, you know, Majora's Mask, they're not really monsters, they're more your friends, and that's why that's a different timeline, because that's when the hero nice. won, and that's yeah. when Light prospered. And so, by retrospect, they're even still adding more to this game that when you go back and play it, that's how I look at it now because I've read this stuff. I'm like, damn, that's that's really cool. Even though 
it's just a, a huge retcon, but it, I feel like it really kind of deepened the story for it and what this game like meant for the Legend of Zelda moving forward. Yeah, I love the fact that Legend of Zelda has always been kind of this multi timeline thing that like never got shit. No one ever really gave it shit unless they were trying to collectively put it together. But there's all these different storylines that tie in, and uh, yeah, Link to the Past was fantastic. Um, I will say, if we're throwing in fun facts, maybe one that you didn't know about sure. since it's coming out is that this game, they were trying to port it over to the Game Boy, which was also hugely successful, and it kind of wasn't going too well that they just decided to make something completely different and go off script without permission, and that is how they turned out with Link's Awakening. Ooh, which you would say is arguably the better game? My favorite Zelda yeah, of okay. all time. Yeah, good. Which is also coming out here shortly, oh, very man. soon. Yeah, that's a that's a day and day. That's a buy. That's yeah, a buy. and so just to be trying to remake something some people consider one of the greatest games of all time just to create something that I hold in my heart as a favorite yeah. but just to come out with another you know class masterpiece I got me a link to the past right there dude we got we should start it and beat it on the cart and just see I'd be down for that like, spend a good day that'd be nice that'd be fantastic because it is an excellent game so moving into my number two this takes my pretty much my RPG spot and guys when you talk about the SNES it's it was hard for me not to just litter my list with with um, RPGs, right? Because you've got like Secret of Mana, you've got Chrono Trigger, you've got excellent games. But the one I had to decide on was Final Fantasy III, or as it originally was in Japan, was Final Fantasy VI, which is by Square. Originally came out on April 2nd, 1994. And that's Square Soft. This was, I, the, when I looked it up on Wikipedia, it just says Square. So oh. I don't know if there was ever a time they just wore Square and then soft, and then Enix. Square. I thought it was always Square Soft. I, so did I. Maybe. So I, only, I wrote it down like I saw it, but again. I'll say right now, I've never played a single Final Fantasy before 7. See, and that was the thing. This one, I played after 7. Again, I actually have two cart versions of it in my in my collection. Um, I went back and played it after 7. 7 got me into Final Fantasies. But this game, is it's set in this industrial revolution kind of um period piece which i love when fantasy can mix with tech like that and one of the cool concepts is that it's got 14 um characters that you can mess around with and play which is more than any other mainline final fantasy story yeah has that's ever for had. sure yeah and i almost missed the days where there you know you had more than maybe a five or six person ensemble i think it's too many i oh but I, lo was, I love choice but that's too much for me for something but back like that. on the day when you're doing like a like a snes version of it and you're not doing like a like a PlayStation that requires movement and things like that. You could you could add in these characters. And, I mean, these characters, you had, like, Terra, you had Locke, you had Celeste, you had Sabin. Uh, and then you have this villain, Kefka, that a lot of people remember. Kind of really... Iconic, yeah. Yeah, really Joker-esque. And the world actually starts off being fine. You're doing this mission. And at some point, you know, spoiler, I guess, the villain kind of wins because it becomes post-apocalyptic. And I, I remember that being one of the defining moments. I was like... Holy That's the shit, one thing like, I do know is someone who hasn't played this game, I know who Kefka is and I know what he did yeah, because he, it's on everybody's he list. He essentially wins for a minute because the whole game gets flipped on its head. And I got to say, it, it introduced a lot of cool characters and a lot of new concepts per character. So that was the RPG that took me, uh, that took this spot for me. It was hard to kind of think of one. I'm sure you maybe have one or two. No, I, I didn't even have one on mine. Okay. But, yeah, when I was younger and I had my SNES days, that was... I was a simple child, a simple lad. <laughs> uh, yeah, run him and done him. But yeah, Final Fantasy uh, 3 is, I think, one of the games that still hold up to this day. So My number one, then, as you always know, because I we get into an argument all the time, is going to be Donkey Kong Country 2. Oh, boy. Diddy's Conquest. Not I, only, think, I think we're going to have another issue. <laughs> not only does it have one of the best, most creative names, because it's Diddy's Conquest, of course, a play on the words Conquest, I didn't realize that until I got older. I, always I thought didn't it realize was, that until you told me that. I thought I it was we Diddy Kong's yeah. quest. I think we were driving to Vegas or something, and I think you said that to me, and I was like, huh, I didn't know that either. Yeah, I yeah, I always thought it was Diddy Kong's quest. So for the longest time, I always read it wrong, just thought about it wrong in my head. But you thought about it Kong? Oh, Ugh. could have been. <laughs> Should have been, would have been. Ugh. But uh, they a, a game that I do think is superior to the original. Amazing soundtrack that I think is better in every way. Amazing bosses that I think are a lot funner than what they offer in the first one. And of course you can play between Diddy or Dixie Kong. And then they even take a play on some of the originals. So instead of just 
a minecart jumping around. It's like a roller coaster, and you're riding on a skull. It's like the same mechanics, but it just feels like a lot more fun. It's not... It, it's... They take a lot of things from the original and they just improve on it and the things that are there that are the same, they put just a little bit of twist on it that it just it feels completely different. Um, it's it's and again, we're we're getting into my f- number one. It's hard to argue with what you're saying because Donkey Kong Country two is arguably considered to be the best of the Donkey Kong Country games. That's what a lot of... I, I mean, Gameplay, it, it, it can mechanics. go between 2 and 3. I never see anyone say 1 first, but I will say the thing that everyone says is that 2 has the best soundtrack. Two, which I, I, I... It's one of my all-time favorite game soundtracks of all time. And I'm, I'm right greatest behind of all time. you. The greatest of all time. And I'm right behind you, man, because Donkey Kong Country 3, for me... Is your number 1? Is my number 1. And yeah. we're, we're really hitting some, some strides here. Oh, and... I'm not going to argue with anything Andrew says. I'm not going to say, because again, this is all subjective. I'm not going to say his is wrong, because I don't think Donkey Kong Country 3 improves on any of the game mechanics that 1 or 2 set. When I, where I think this shines, and it's more of the kind of the meta gamer in me that wants to play an expansive, a more expansive game, is it offers just a little more in, in terms of the world traveling system. You get to meet up, so in this one you play Dixie, which is the one from number two, and you get to play her, I think it's her cousin, Kitty Kong, and you meet up with Funky Kong, and he's he's making all your vehicles. So instead of just being on kind of a dot-to-dot thing, how the old Donkey Kongs were, I, that's on number two. It's just this, linear path, yeah. Where this one gives you kind of a world map, and you get to drive yourself there. You get to, I mean, you get to explore a little bit, because also in this game, you can go find these um, banana birds. That you can collect and get, um, I believe it's, I don't know if it's an alternate ending or like the best ending. It's probably a separate ending. Two does something like that similar. But yeah, if you collect this, and the other thing is like, you meet like the brother bears. There's these bears on all these islands that all have an item and a barter system. So when you go beat a boss and he gives you a, a patch, you can go upgrade your patch with Funky to get the hovercraft to go over to the rocks. And now when you go over to the rocks, you buy the mirror off of a bear who's selling it to bring it to this other bear because he's vain and wants to look at himself and he gives you the bomb. It kind of reminds me of Link's Awakening. Yeah, say that, that this, trading yeah, system. Yeah, it's got this yeah. trade system that you can kind of move that, that is just more than the the platform gaming and that's why I've always loved it. And it's always nice to have something simple like that that can really make something stand exactly, out. Exactly, because I think it took what 1 and 2 did. I don't think it improved on it. I think it's on par. It just added a little more to it. Um, I don't think the, the soundtrack is any... Better than number two. Number two is arguably regarded as the best, one of the best SNES soundtracks ever. But I think if you're looking to play a game that gave you more than just moving from level to level, this kind of did it. Who is the enemy in number two? Is it the, what's he go by? Is he Captain K. Rule? Captain K. Rule, which I also didn't know, so I got older that it's supposed to just be cruel. cruel. Okay, yeah, because this one you get Baron K. Uh, Rulenstein. Yeah. Where, oh, yeah. It's kind of like a Frankenstein. And <laughs> yeah. He, he makes this robot that you essentially fight at the end of the game. And when you beat it, you find out that it's actually Donkey Kong and Diddy. That's why they're not in this game. They've been captured. They've been powering this thing. And then you can actually find a uh, an in-game secret where one of the vehicles that you upgrade, you spin it around and it unlocks uh, the secret world, Krematoa. And that's how you officially beat the game and go fight Krulenstein. So it's got, I mean, it's just a little more yeah. in depth, I think, in terms of. Story. To add something like that, too, like if you get like a certain amount of coins, I forget what it's called. It's like a little like Utopia thing pass, and then you fight K. Rule again, but he's not the captain anymore. I think this time he's almost like kind of like a scientist or something, and his attacks are just completely different, but that's how you get like the true, true ending. Yeah. I, I just like that we both landed on a Donkey Kong because they are great pick up, uh, pick up games, and. Donkey Kong, if you guys ever want to look up like the history of it, is one of those saving franchises on the Super Nintendo that kept the longevity of it going in an era right. where like the um, completely different Sega art style, Genesis yeah. was coming out, where they kind of kept that going and uh, fantastic. But I love it. So let's recap it, Andrew. My top five, starting at five to one, was Lost Vikings, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Four, Turtles in Time, Harvest Moon, Final Fantasy Three, and Donkey Kong Country Three. And I went Mortal Kombat Two. Zombies Ate My Neighbors, Mega Man X, Legend of Zelda Link's Link's Way, A Link to the Past, and then Donkey Kong Country 2, Diddy's Conquest. Oh, I forgot. Donkey Kong Country 3 is called, I think it's Dixie Kong's Double Trouble. Yeah. So, 
those are five games, guys, that if you're not looking to play something that's just Mario based on the SNES, give these 10 games a shot. Give them a try. Let us know how you feel. And guys, please chime in and let us know if you like this video, the next top five, top 10 we should do, because we're always looking to see what you guys uh, yeah. have to offer us. Yeah, recommend a list to us or even put your list in there. I'm always interested to see what everyone else's opinions are. Definitely. So, guys, we had fun doing it. My name is Craig Prowse. That is Andrew Montemayor. And until next time... Cheers.